uh, non listed private media entities are very cagey about sharing their numbers but this is the second year in a row that times internet is releasing an annual report on their own putting out all the numbers out there on display and to discuss more on this uh, we have with us uh, satyan gajwani vice chairman times internet joining us all the way from san francisco hi hi mr gajwani hi nita how are you good and thank you for joining us thank you thank uh, you for having me let, let me start with the most important question uh, can you tell us why times internet a private company has thought it important to release these comprehensive figures yet again and is that going to be a practice every year yeah well so we started it last year um and i think it's something that i would like to continue for the foreseeable future um mm -hmm. part of part of what happens for us is we have over about 6000 employees across the company we've got investors in a couple of our underlying assets and just generally we have stakeholders across the times group and outside who are our advertising partners and what not who genuinely care about what's happening um the times group and times internet traditionally have been pretty private about uh really sharing more than what's required but in a way i feel like uh being more explicit and transparent about what we're trying to do helps us really build alignment across everybody internally and externally uh, the truth is we don't really think of ourselves facing much direct competition as much as ourselves and so in a way being very public about where we are and what our aspirations are actually i think brings better accountability onto the business teams and the management to really deliver against those goals and be aligned around trying to achieve them fantastic so you registered a 40% growth last year and i think 24% this year going by the report uh, so tell me That's what right. are the gambles that really uh, play, paid off you know what were the planned risks that you took can really really work for you yeah i mean i think the you know revenue is obviously the the easiest way to measure the company for us there's every business is in a different stage and so sometimes we see some that are uh, more mature than others so for example um i think certainly the most successful sort of transition in the last year has been with mx player uh which really went from not really being competitive or existing in the premium ott space to now becoming the market leader in that and that's widely sort of understood um and we did that with a very untraditional strategy of buying a non video asset and building a video property into it and that's been very successful for us um the growth that we've seen there in consumption is pretty unparalleled and the revenue growth is pretty strong as well but really our priority in the first couple of years of MX player was to really establish product market fit and get people to love it um the early feedback is very strong in that regard and so today when we look at times internet as an ecosystem 5 years ago we weren't really from a media side beyond news we weren't really that relevant today our media assets our, our entertainment assets specifically Ghana and MX now reach over 400 million monthly users and they do represent uh almost half of the reach of the group now on digital and so you know our our entertainment footprint has really been on the media side our strongest success in the last couple of years and and tell me what are the gambles that did not pay off yeah okay um <laughs> huh I had I didn't have that one ready. Let me think about it for a second. Um I won't say they haven't paid off as much as they haven't succeeded yet to the scale that we want them to. Um you know the thesis of Times Internet is that we can be both a really strong media business and then a really strong at a services and transactions business. And the reason that these should all exist in one company is that they're symbiotic. The media businesses bring in very large audience bases. but those transactional businesses really monetize very well because people use them to buy goods to avail services to do much more than just simply consume content. And so the thesis is that if we get good at what we're trying to do, the media businesses bring in users and then we can funnel some of them to the transactional businesses where we monetize them very well. The other reason it's symbiotic is that the transactional businesses have data that no other ecosystem really has. So for instance today we have the capability of saying target people looking for two bedroom homes in Noida across our network because we can leverage data signals that we get from magic bricks and use them across the entire ecosystem. And so the thesis is that the media businesses bring users to the transactional businesses and the transactional businesses provide proprietary data uh back to our media ecosystem which makes it richer and more effective. 
It's kind um, of interconnected that, for you in this case. Right, so that's, that's the intent. Um, the truth is that we've done it, we've built the plumbing. So all of that actually exists as a capability because we do have a common identity stack underneath everything we do now, which really gives us an intelligence and abilities that others don't have. But I don't think we've leveraged it enough. Um, one of my major priorities over the next few years is to push crosswalk as a metric for us to say, how do we better pollinate users across our different properties? Um, you know, we made good progress last year. I think the number of users who consume two or more of our properties grew 40 something percent. And the number of users who consume three or more of our properties grew 120 percent. Okay. But the base is still small. And so if you ask me where we've not been as successful, I think we have a lot more room to go in terms of actually getting good at leveraging the ecosystem's capability more than each underlying asset just being good on their own. Okay. You're talking about a property whose base is not really small. It's pretty big. I want to come to MX player. Uh, you know, it has been one of your most exciting acquisitions and the most talked about. But before I ask my question, I want to understand from you, uh, since the time of acquisition, MX has grown about 15%, if I'm not wrong from uh, 175 million monthly active users when you acquired it to about 200 as per app, app Annie. Is that correct? No, it's grown more than that. And so there's two different things to look at. One is sometimes we look at the India numbers and the global numbers. MX is actually 70% of its consumption is in India. The balance is outside. And so sometimes we compare the India to the global numbers. And so you might get mixed numbers there. But the more important metric with MX isn't the total audience growth as much as the uh, premium OTT growth. So the way it works is when we bought MX, it was a very, very large asset to play back videos on your phone, not mm -hmm. streaming videos. We built a streaming product into it about 18 months ago. And that okay. streaming product itself has effectively gone from zero users to over 200 million monthly users. Okay. And so in essence, the total audience growth, I think it's been closer to about 40 or 50% in the last year. I don't have the number right off the top of my head. This but is just the total Indian. audience is... Yeah, just in India. So the, the total audience has grown a certain extent, but more important than the overall app growth has been the streaming product growth, because that's really what is comparable to what's out there in the market and what today is really, really large and sort of passing most others. So in, in that case, let me reframe my question. You know, for most OTT uh, apps, uh, the problem is to build uh, audiences. In your case, luckily for you, you already had a good base with your video playback app, uh, 175 million or so. So exactly. tell me, has it been difficult to convert them and get them to come to streaming, uh, you know, as an OTT platform? It's a great question. And it was honestly the biggest gamble of what we did. So we bought this asset for over $100 million. I think we invested at that point in time um, mm. without knowing if it would work. And I think that has been where the majority of the team's energy has gone into thinking about how to make it as successful of a transition as possible. Um, mm. The, the, the simple answer I can give you today is that more than 70% of our users every month consumes the streaming product. And that was zero a couple of years ago when it didn't exist. So I think if you ask me what's been the biggest success for us, it's been that ability to actually transition users over. There's a lot of companies, including us at times, who talk about moving audiences from one product to another. And I can tell you with probably more experience in doing this across different businesses than most have, it's not easy, um, mm -hmm. but our strategy was different. You know, I think what we saw a couple of years ago was that everyone was excited to say, we're going to build the Netflix of India. And so we saw 20, 30 different OTT apps get launched saying, oh, I'm a good movie producer. I'm a good TV show producer. I'll make an app, put them on there and people will come and subscribe and I'll grow really big. Um, and I think, you know, the core skill that we really have is really understanding digital consumer products and technology and where they con uh, converge with the media ecosystem. And I think one of the insights we had is that a successful product really needs to have as much of strategic thinking on distribution and growth as much as it does on content. And so when everyone else was saying, we'll make a bunch of shows and stick them on an app and then figure out how to get users, we took the opposite approach, which was if we had this very large captive entertainment consuming audience, could we bring, um, could we bring great content to them and build a positive experience? And, you know, I think it's been a combination of good product tech strategies to make the conversion, as well as just actually really good content. I mean, I have to give credit to that because it's a, it sounds like a very traditional skill, but like our recent show that we launched a couple of weeks ago, Ashram, 
I think it crossed 100 million streams in the first week. It's broken all of our internal records in terms mm -hmm. of expectations on output. Um, but I think it's, it's a mix of both. And it really is emblematic of us as a company. Being really good at traditional media skills, like producing great storytelling and content, alongside having that sort of technology DNA to think about growth and app distribution and scale and conversion mm -hmm. and a lot of behind the scenes backend work to be effective in that. Um, and then bringing them together into just a good consumer experience. It, it's a given, uh, you spoke about uh, Ashram and then you also had Queen. Queen, yeah. Which, which uh, was quite, uh, which pretty much got the eyeballs. Uh, tell me, so you have the great content out there, but as far as subscription is concerned, you have Time Prime, uh, Times Prime, you have Ghana Plus, TOI, ET Prime and Gome Password, Passport. Why have you kept MX Player out of that ad-free model? You're, you're one of the few people who knows most of the actual subscription products we launch because we have too many out there right now, as you can see. Um, but uh, so there's two things here I'll say. One is MX is two years old. And I think, you know, particularly given that it was a fairly untested strategy to see whether you could successfully convert users, we feel like fill, filling product market fit was the first priority and actually getting customer engagement there. The mm -hmm. other thing, the other thing that's pretty untraditional about MX, and again, it really has to do with more of our product technology DNA than anything is, we've actually made it, you know, the, the, the phrase that defines it is everytainment. And the reason we use that is that it actually has gone beyond video. Okay. So today the MX player app actually offers music and gaming as well. And right. so, you know, our intent is actually to be pretty different from the rest of the OTTs in the market and really think about, we have this massive audience in India that's seeking consumer digital entertainment content and experiences. Part of that may be around video, part of it may be around music, part of it might be around gaming. The most recent thing we launched is in the short form video space. Okay. And so, you know, the way we think about it is, can we really provide a holistic entertainment offering across different experiences? And if we get really good at building that engagement, so for example, users who consume video and gaming, have, I think, 6x the monthly time spent of consumers who just consume video, uh, just to give you a sense on how this works. And so our priority today is really to just fill that customer need. The subscription models and figuring out new ways to monetize, those will all develop over the next couple of years. But, but in my view, this is like you're building the next, you know, what were the big TV networks that kind of dominated digital television media over the last five, 10 years. We're building that for the digital world. And this has a five, 10 year horizon to really get to that scale. We're in year two. So I think if we overemphasized monetization at this stage, we would probably mess it up a little bit. You know, you spoke about uh, gaming, you know, that's become the new sensation among teens and you pretty much launched it at the right time. I think February, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so, that's right. Tell me, uh, I'm sure this report probably doesn't have uh, much about gaming, but uh, how do you see that contributing uh, to the revenues of Times Internet here on? In a rather it's significant. Though. You know, one of, the, one of the challenges for Times Internet is that we've got like so many big assets and then we've got a lot of emerging bets. And so, mm -hmm. you know, some of those emerging bets may make it, some may not. And we're pretty dispassionate about saying that we want to sort of be experimentative about it. Um, but gaming is one of the sort of fast growing emerging bets for us. So we have two essential plays in gaming. We have a standalone app called Curica. And then mm -hmm. MX has built gaming within the game, within the MX app. Okay. Both of them are growing extremely well. Uh, in general, we stay away from things like poker, rummy, and the Dimpati type games, which I think for us at least ethically don't feel like they fit for us as a company. Okay. Um, and we've also stayed away from fantasy. And we focused a lot more on casual gaming and trivia where we feel like it's both light, entertaining, something that mm -hmm. people can really engage with, but not necessarily things that veer you down sort of the the negative habits around things like gambling and whatnot that other apps tend to, can, can potentially fall victim to, I think. Um, so we think about gaming uh, sort of as a broader space. We've started with casual games and trivia as our starting footprint. But if you think about it this way, our goal is basically to think about better ways to monetize our audience over time. We've built, we have 550 million monthly users. Nobody in India comes close to that in terms of scale. And so as we think about ways to better engage and monetize that audience, gaming is probably the most natural segue from media and entertainment, uh, because it really is in that space in between where it is an a form of entertainment and media, but it is a place where at least globally, there's a lot of trends of customers paying. There's a very different level of engagement with gaming users when they get into it. 
Um, and so I do think you'll see us push more into the gaming ecosystem over the next few years. And that would become a significant revenue creator for you, is it? Hopefully. Next, by next year? Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, it's growing much faster than the rest of, than the average growth of Times Internet. I think, for example, Karika, I think, has grown 600% this year. Um, again, small base, but meaningfully contributing in terms of scale. I think it'll cross, I mean, I don't know what it'll exactly cross this year, but it's scaling very, very fast right now. Another launch uh, that happened recently is Takatak. Uh, you know, I think the ban the ban on Chinese apps was pretty much pretty godsend for all the Indian companies. Uh, you know, Z launched something called Hippy, and Times launched Takatak, uh, and several others. And Ghana Hot Shops, we launched two. <laughs> right, right, that too. So, so tell me, is Takatak better place to replace TikTok for the Indian audiences? And you know, will the kind of scale TikTok had in India has in India rather? Yeah, you know, honestly, it was it was funny. We have a very strong uh, product and technology team across Times Internet. We have over a thousand product and technology engineers in the company, which again, I don't think any Indian company would have that level of scale. Um, unlike other, I guess I can't say it's really unlike others, but Tucka Tuck is really a technology platform play at its heart. There's an element about getting creators and building really good content experiences, but it's so much about really efficient, fast, seamless videos, uh, streaming and capabilities there. And then it's about really good personalization and, and recommendation algorithms. Mm -hmm. I was honestly pretty skeptical when we launched it saying, look, there's gonna be many players in the market. I don't know how big it'll scale up, but it's been two months and it has by far exceeded my expectations on where I thought it could get to. Um, we are extremely bullish about it because we do feel like um, the space, you know, we, there is a void, right? We know with TikTok not there, there's a very large void. And the consumption we've seen just in the last two months really is emblematic of how large the desire and consumer need is for it. Uh, we also think it's really, really complementary with both our music and video platforms. And that's why, honestly, we've launched two plays in the space. Uh, we're definitely going to invest pretty aggressively behind both Ghana Hot Shots and MX Tucka Tuck. Um, they approach it a little bit differently. Ghana's is a little bit more music centric first because it really fits with where they are and it's embedded in the Ghana app. And MX is more of a general video entertainment approach. Um, but both of them have seen phenomenal uptake from users. I mean, way more than we expected. And so, um, you know, ultimately, it, it, again, it really fits with our, our, our core, right? We, we operate in this, in the sort of the, the space between media and technology. And I think mm -hmm. short form video is very much a platform that operates in that space too. Um, and, and our early traction at least indicates to me that there's a lot more potential there. And this is also within the year for EdTech app applications. Uh, you know, you have something called GradeUp, even though according to me, it's, right. it's one of the least known times internet properties. Uh, you've obviously seen about 4x growth uh, as per the report uh, for GradeUp. Yeah. Tell me, how are you planning to grade it further up? You know? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Now, GradeUp is actually, so GradeUp started in, in T-Labs, which was our incubator uh, that we had a, a few, few years ago. And it was one of the teams that we saw so much promise in that we gave an offer to acquire uh, a larger stake in and back. And so we've been financing it now for a few years. Um, and the product quality and team quality is just fantastic there. So GradeUp, I think, will cross 100 crores this year, if I understand it correctly but it was less than 25 last year. And so the trajectory that it's on is very strong. The problem is as many of our assets face is when you're within Times Internet, which you know this year did over 1600 crores of revenue, um, it's, hard to, uh, <laughs> it's hard to sometimes uh, stand out independently of that. Um, but what, what we love about GradeUp is a few things that I think are really unique. Um, one is that the user retention and product quality is really strong. So, so one of the metrics we look at is collections to revenue booked. Because if you sell someone an education product, how many people actually want it enough that they end up paying for it? And our ratio there is like above 90%, which is well higher than the average in the industry. GradeUp also has across different products that it offers over 200,000 subscribers, which is a significant number um, for both the live classes and the test prep work that they're doing. So we're extremely bullish on it. Obviously, it's seen big growth this year, partially because of macro factors that have played in. Um, it is a very competitive segment. You know, certainly mm -hmm. Baiju's and Academy raising significant money is something that we have to think about how do we play our strategy alongside it. But in general, our approach has been build the best product, 
market it effectively, bring customers to it, and you'll find a good outcome. And that's generally worked for great up so far. And I think that's what we'll continue to do going forward. And another observation I had is uh, that, you know, your print arm, uh, Bennett and Coleman, uh, that has excessively relied on its uh, English publications over the vernacular banners over, your, over the years for revenue. Uh, you know, as a younger company, I'm comparing it with the 160-year-old company. That's why younger. Uh, you know, would, 182. <laughs> <laughs> would you avoid a situation like that for times in it and focus more on uh, vernacular languages here on? You know, even your report says the growth for non-English uh, audiences is outpaced. So how will you go further from here? Definitely. So, you know, when we, we today reach 550 million monthly users, the majority of them are not English first speakers. And, and so most of our high reaching products, whether it's QuickBuzz, even TOI, MX and Ghana, all four of them are aggressively working on product development that is very, very local language centric. So in fact, today, most people don't know this, but all four of those apps give you the ability mm -hmm. to select the language before you start, um, including TOI, which is different than what people would expect. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we look at our actual growth in usage in the last year, almost 80% of the growth of the, of the growth that we saw came from non-English audiences. So we're investing very hard behind thinking about how to build experiences that are better for our first time mobile phone users, non-English users, and building experiences that are relevant for them. From a transactions and subscription strategy, I think we'll probably be a little bit more balanced or see more from the English side because ultimately propensity to spend, we still find to be stronger with English audiences. Um, and certainly things like personal finance and mutual fund buying and buying sort of more expensive products and going out to fancy restaurants that open to dine out. Um, right. You know, inevitably those things skew more towards urban audiences where at least the, the balance of English and non-English skews a little more towards English. Uh, but, but it's important for us from the media footprint side, certainly, and we're investing very heavily behind building better non-English experiences um, on the media side. You know, another thing is uh, Times Internet started about 20 years ago, and it pretty much had a head start over most digital firms in the country at that point. Now, in your, I was reading one of your earlier interviews, and you did confess that, you know, uh, the TIL offerings weren't in great shape in the beginning of the last decade. So after Google, then came Google, then Facebook. Right now, would you say the pecking order would have been completely different had you been in an attack mode right from the beginning and didn't start really late? You know, it's been great for you for the past three, four years, but it hasn't always been like that. Yeah. Um, look, I, I, part of why we put out this report is to be very, very honest and put a mirror in front of ourselves. Um, I do think one of the mistakes we made in the past was I actually think our ambition was not the issue. We had very large ambitions for it, but you have to be able to deliver the best experience against that ambition. And I think we probably approached digital businesses a little bit too much like traditional businesses in the 2000s, maybe the early 2010s, um, and that we put a lot more emphasis on things like content and brand and marketing more than on actual product technology and underlying engineering capability. Um, you know, the best reflection I can give, uh, the best statement I can give that reflects the sort of changed culture and priority is that the CEO of Times Internet, Gautam Sinha, was at one point the former CTO of the company. And many of the senior leaders of the company today come from engineering and product backgrounds, not from media backgrounds. And, you know, ultimately media is always gonna be in our blood. It's a core part of our DNA. But I think really making sure that we infused a very strong competence on product and technology and on um, sort of really being able to deliver great underlying product experiences was a very, very critical change that's helped us a lot. Um, the other thing that I think this honestly changed is that we've been a bit more dispassionate and honest about what's working and not. And mm -hmm. we look at our outcomes very binary. If something is working, we want to double down, triple down on it, really scale it up and see it get to market leadership position. And if we don't think that's possible, then we won't do it. And we should look for exits or look for models to sort of scale down that kind of a business. Um, mm -hmm. And I think as long as we're honest with ourselves and we hold ourselves accountable to really being the best consumer experiences we can, you know, I think thus far it's delivered good results for us in the last 10 years. 
Um, but, but it does require an ability to be very, very adaptive and recognizing that every six months you're going to face new competition in new forms from new places. And if you're not ready to continue to deliver, deliver the best experience to your customers, you're probably going to lose. Um, and a little bit of that paranoia, I think, is healthy for the company. I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, it's, it's 2020 has been a rather bad year for everybody. You know, what yep. is uh, your sense of uh, how things will perform for you? On one hand, you have something like your news business and your OTT, which is exploding. And on the other hand, you have brands like Dine Out, which obviously has seen better days because the lockdown yep. is really not the yep. right time for it. So, so how do you see uh, the books panning out for 2020, uh, for March 2021, right. rather? So it's, it's a good question. I think, so I'll, I'll address the first half of the year and the second half. In the first half of the year, our business is, and I think, again, it's a, it's a great part about our culture is that our teams feel very, very emotionally aligned to the success of what they're doing. And so very, very proactively, all of our businesses thought about ways to, to manage their cost structures. We took salary cuts, we delayed variable pay, um, and we cut down expenses that really weren't critical because nobody knew what the next six months, 12 months would look like. You know, while we've had some businesses that obviously have structural challenges in the current COVID environment, specifically the ones that are very offline centric, like, you know, going out to restaurants has affected dine out. Um, most of our businesses, we're very lucky, have actually probably seen a, either a very fast rebound or just a positive growth throughout the COVID times. Um, in the case of dine out, they've actually done a lot of business innovation and moved towards contactless dining product experiences that they can deliver to restaurants. So today, actually, I think over two or 3,000 restaurants have actually purchased the sort of contactless dining software sets that we've built out for our restaurants and malls and other offline experiences and are deploying it ready. So I think there's a good amount of innovation there. But for most of our businesses that are really digital first and digital only experiences, honestly, COVID has accelerated a lot of the growth trends over the last three to five years. And so what happened was April, May, June or March, April, May, you know, even with growth in consumption, we saw ad revenues fall because everyone was sort of uncertain. But by August now, we're actually positive year over year. Um, I think by June or July, we started to see positive growth month on month. And by August, it's rebounded so aggressively that we're actually up, even including the, the down months in the beginning of the year. And so now we're in September, we're, we're sort mm -hmm. of resyncing up as a company to say, okay, first half of the year was about survival, about you know, managing your business correctly, really hunkering down in hard times and thinking about what to do. But now we're back. And so now the second mm -hmm. half of the year is, okay, how do we get back on our mission of chasing that billion dollar revenue target in the next few years? And what are the things we need to do? And what are the major goals we're gonna sort of reset ourselves to achieve by the end of this fiscal year? So in my view, this year is a, is a tale of two different halves. Half one was, in a way, probably good for us long-term. It helped us sort of reevaluate cost structures and make sure we got our heads in order there. Um, and now the second half of the year is back to that growth trajectory that we've been sort of chasing for a while and have had for the last few years and saying, okay, there's this new um, sort of customer readiness to assume digital products more than ever before. How are we going to really capitalize on it? And so we're very, very excited about the rest of the year, to be very honest. And, and one last question I want to ask you is, you know, we all know you moved to U.S. four years ago to expand the Times Internet base. Uh, so I have to ask you, what is the next big acquisition happening? And is that happening <laughs> soon? And what space is it going to be in? You can give us a clue. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've acquired 15 businesses, I think, in the last five or six years. And, you know, a lot of people think it was purely about business interest. And it was to some degree. Um, but it was also a lot about um, cultural sort of a, a, a transformation for the company. You know, probably one of the things I'm most proud of is that of the 15 businesses we've acquired, I think 13 of the founders are still working with us today. Um, it was important because we really wanted to infuse real entrepreneurial culture into the company. And I think we've been successful in doing that. To be honest, while we do look at M&A and we're going to continue to look at some, I think earlier on, the mandate was the mandate I put upon us was we just need to have really good products and we need to feel confident that we're building really good assets. And so we looked at M&A opportunistically to say, what are great assets that are probably not being recognized by others enough that we could really leverage and build up around. 
today we've got a portfolio of very strong assets. And so now when we think about M&A, we think about it with really two major goals. One is, can it take an existing business of ours and make it better? And so, for example, Dine Out was actually an M&A, has actually done three acquisitions of its own to improve its software stack that it offers to restaurants. So it bought Inresto and a POS player as well on that purpose. Um, so there's extensional M&A, which helps our businesses get stronger in what they're doing. And then the second is when we think about the holistic strategy of Times Internet, where we've got sort of a steady chugging along advertising business, but then rapid growth on subscription and transactions, there are pieces that are going to be important to helping us realize that vision of scaling those parts up. And so very strategically, we're thinking about some M&A and spaces that can fit to those missions. And uh, I can't say what exactly those are just yet. Um, mm -hmm. But I think in general, our, our, you know, we've got more use than we know what to do with. We have you know, more engagement. You know, we've grown, to give you a sense, we've grown daily active users 28x in the last five years. Um, it's, you know, it, the, the audience scale is not our challenge. We've got 110 million people using it every day for 45 minutes a day. That is a huge amount of engagement, well beyond any other Indian company. So now our mandate is what do we do with it? And how do we better leverage it? How do we build better experiences for the customers? And how do we monetize it better? And so when we think about M&A, we think about things that can help us on that trajectory. Mm -hmm. Looking at a more aggressive uh, times internet in the days to come and hope you continue to balance great content and technology and uh, hope to uh, hope I get to see more of you <laughs> whenever you come to India. I would Thank love you. to catch Thank up you. with you. I appreciate, appreciate you actually, you really have studied us and I appreciate that you spent the time to understand the assets of it, you know, before we talk.